Okay, let's start. <laughs> Again, welcome all. Um, all of you here in the room today and all of you joining us online. As you know, today we are um, hearing about many processes at the national, at the regional and the global level that seek to propose standards, regulate the internet and its governance. However, we feel that a foundational discussion that should precede those discussions about uh, governance, architecture, and, and policies, concrete policy proposals, should be, um, it's not gaining sufficient attention and should, should be then uh, a bit more of a priority and, and have more space for discussion. And that's pretty much what we are trying to create with this session. And these questions have to do with what is the nature of the internet itself, how it has changed over time, and what are the fundamental characteristics of the internet in the past, today, and what are the, uh, the main ones that, how we want them to be in the future? What are the main ones that we want to remain as they are uh, in the years to come? So in the session, we'll have a stellar group of experts that will share their views on the answers for all these questions. I'll present each of them as I give them the floor. Um, and to begin with, we'll hear um, some op opening remarks by Mr. Pablo Castro. Mr. Castro is coordinator of cybersecurity from the Ministry for Foreign Relations of Chile. Mr. Castro, you have the word. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? I hope so, yeah. So good afternoon to everyone, and also I have to say good morning and good night to everyone who is connected online. And thank you very much to all uh, who organized this important panel. It's an honor for the government of Chile to participate in these joint sessions with representatives from civil society at the eighth and annual meetings of the United Nations Internet Governance Forum. It has been 17 years since the Internet Governance Forum was established. And since then, the internet has acquired relevance that is increasingly linked with people's quality of life, enabling them not only to connect with family and friends, but also to exercise fundamental rights. It is essential that the internet, including its support and infrastructure, remains open, safe, interconnected, and accessible to all. From our country's perspective, it is only possible to address a significant challenge through increasing international cooperations among different stakeholders. In recent years, there has been a debate around the nature of the internet. It is a right by itself or a tool to exercise this other rights. The answer to, this, to these questions could have deep implications for the formulations and development of public policies related with the internet from definitions of the obligation that each state has regarding this technology. On one hand, if we consider the internet as a right by itself, Different questions arise in relation to whom should guarantee access to it and under what conditions, as well as the implication to shared infrastructures and regulations on internet providers. On the other hand, if we consider the internet as a tool to exercise of other rights, such as freedom of expression or access to information, then the obligations state should have will be focused on guaranteeing that people have the capacity to use the internet for this purpose. Uh, this includes reducing the economic, geographic, and technological, technological barriers that limit access to the internet. The question of whether internet providers from the private sector and concessions holders of public service is another key issue surrounding this debate. If the internet is considered a public go good, that internet providers can be seen as agents that give access to an essential service, which poses questions about regulation and ensuring equitable access. In Chile, Congress is discussing a bill related to acknowledging the internet as a public service. The goal that underpins the discussion is to reduce the gap in internet accessibility that keeps nearly 35% of Chilean's homes without access to this network. The project considered imposing certain obligations regarding universality in relation to the areas of coverage at the time to connect them. Related to this is the possibility of giving subsidies for the demand for the connection service. The motivation behind the discussions, which affects both public and private investment, is to allow most citizens to have access to all services offered through the internet. Furthermore, the intervention of a state in the name of public interest is an issue that must be analyzed with caution. 
even though it is necessary to guarantee equitable access and protection of citizens' rights, it can be also invoke risk, such as censorships and limitation to freedom online. Ultimately, common goods governance, such as the internet, is a complex challenge. It requires a balance between the protection of individual rights and the promotion of the public interest. It is also implies collaboration among different stakeholders, including governments, private sector, academia, tech community, and civil society. In this stakeholders dialogue for public policies about the internet, we invite you, you to think about this question and search for answers that can reflect the evolving and essential nature of the internet of our current society. Thank you very much for all your attention. Thank you, Mr. Castro, for setting the scene. And what we'll have now is the first round of comments. So we have some speakers that will talk about different approaches to looking at the internet. We'll have um, each speaker talking about one specific approach. Um, and then in a second round of um, contributions, we'll have commentators that will be reacting to what they heard in the first round. Um, and as I said, I'm going to move on introducing them as I pass on the microphone to each of them. And we'll start um, looking at the internet as a public good, something that Mr. Castro already referred to in his opening remarks. And I'll invite Luca Belli. Luca Belli is professor of the Fundacion, Fundacion Getulio Vargas Law School in Brazil and coordinator of the Center for Technology and Society. So Luca, um, what does it mean to refer to the internet as a public good? What are the concrete policy consequences of doing that? The concrete responsibilities that arise to different stakeholders based on that? Thank you very much, Paula, for the questions and apologies for, the, for being late. I was lost in the conference venue. And so my, my first, I, I have two key considerations here. Uh, if we speak about the internet, and its relation with uh, public goods or whether the internet itself can be considered as a public good. Uh, the first one, the first dimension is that the internet is a facilitator of public good, but at the same time can also undermine public good. So if we think of public goods like uh, justice, democracy, security, uh, public health, they can all be facilitated by ICTs and by the internet, but at the same time, if we think about all the infodemics that we have just lived during the pandemic, if we think about cybersecurity attack, if you think about meddling in democratic processes, they can also be undermined by the internet. So this, this first dimension of the internet as a, a potential instrument to strengthen public goods or to undermine them is very important and depends is a function of the kind of governance as it was just mentioned the kind of regulation then that ensue from the government governance that we can we are, we are able to to define the other dimension is the internet itself as a, a global public good uh, there are people that are much smarter than me, like Stiglitz, that uh, spoke about this already in the late 90s when he was theorizing, uh, Joseph Stiglitz was, was theorizing, was theorizing a, a culture as a global public good uh, that is uh, non-rival in its access and the benefits are not, not exclusionary. And so, uh, but there is a huge transaction cost to have uh, culture and the internet uh, breaks these transaction costs but here again, it really depends on which kind of internet we are speaking of. Because if we, th if we think about Joseph Stiglitz having a nice, a very good broad broadband connection, a nice PC, uh, and living in a wealthy area where you have, uh, it's easy and, and affordable to have good internet connectivity, that is an excellent example of how the internet is a, glo is a global public good because it allows him to directly connect with the global community and freely exchange, seek and impart ideas and, and, and distribute or, or, or obtain culture. If you think about the, how the majority world access the internet through a smartphone, usually through, through prepaid uh, internet access plans where you have uh, sponsored, zero-rated uh, social media, that are sponsored for free, for free, of course, paid with your data, but not paid with money, whereas all the rest is capped. That is not really 
what jo Joseph Stiglitz had in his mind, and that strongly undermines actually public goods. It, so at, it, I, where, at the same point, the internet could be an enormous engine for uh, strengthening public goods, a public good itself, but also an incredible machine for undermining public goods and also just to, to, to uh, capture individuals into a set of tools that basically datafy them to then manipulate them and therefore undermining democracy, human rights, the economy of entire states, right? So that I think that we have to consider this double nature of the internet when we uh, think about the internet in comparison with public goods. Thank you so much, Luca, and thank you for um, calling attention to the different ways of looking at the internet as both an instrument for like accessing public goods and the internet it's itself as a public good and what kind of internet um, we are talking about. So I'll now pass on the uh, floor to one of our online um, speakers. And we'll have now two speakers that will be discussing the internet as a commons. Where is this concept coming from? How do you apply it to the internet? And Again, what are the concrete consequences of applying it to the internet, um, especially when we use it in policy spaces? So I will start with Nandini Shami. Nandini is Deputy Director of IT for Change, and she'll be joining us online. Nandini. Uh, hi, are you able to hear me? We are. Yeah, okay. Uh, so just like quickly, like getting into the subject, at hand and what does it mean to apply a commons perspective to the internet? I think at a very foundational level, all of us recognize that the entire charm and promise of the internet is its affordance of being a co communication commons for the entire world. And compared to all the other communication technologies that came before it, there is this possibility of many-to-many -many communication that is unmediated by a central broadcaster. And right from the beginning, this is the promise that feminists and progressive movements have always seen. And this is the web that we all celebrate. But uh, when reflecting on the internet as a commons, uh, I want to uh, come to this with a reality check orientation also, that the community communicative ecology of the internet today is such that, as somebody once made a quip about, you know, realistic perspectives on the world, the end of the world seems like far more easier for us to imagine than to think of the end of the big tech business model and its stranglehold over the internet. We are staring at a reality like that. I think that if we have to reclaim the internet as a global communication commons, there are three critical areas that I place before all of you for consideration, and I think we need to fix that. So the first is the issue of like, you know, the infrastructure layer and it's captured by a few powerful corporations. We all know who holds the lion's share of the world's, uh, you know, deep sea cables. And in the other like, you know, layer of the web, when we look at like cloud services, we know that just like four companies own 67% of the cloud services like infrastructure today. And if there is, if the infrastructure is controlled by private sector in such a massive way, what is the scope for commoning? And then we also know that there are these egregious moves where the companies operating uh, in the network infrastructure sector are also getting into the communication services sector. In my own country, there is a debate on net neutrality violations about what happens if telecom companies that hold the lion's share of the Indian market are going to operate in the uh, network like, uh, lay, uh, you know, services, digital services layer, and also demand a network usage fee from the digital services. Uh, there is a policy moving push like that. So what does it really mean for net neutrality? And what does it mean for the voices of everyone? And the other problem we are all familiar with about like what happens when big tech who started out in the communication uh, services layer is controlling the deep sea cables that reach the internet to the most uh, marginalized uh, uh, regions of the world as well. And we, we know this issue and we have to do something about it. Uh, the second issue when you look at the digital services itself, 
the entire point that you know there is a surveillance advertising model and this has completely destroyed the generative power of the hyperlink which was the open sea of the web where the web ran on serendipity and instead you have like you know this kind of uh, social media model of the stream where we are all uh, locked in our own like eco chambers and bubbles and there is no possibility of commoning or any community building we have discussed this problem ad nauseum so i will not like get into that problem again but in terms of looking at solutions if the most radical thing we can come up with is like the model like a digital services act that boats very ill for all of us i think about how do you actually get out of surveillance advertising and think of something different to reclaim uh, communication platforms and the digital spaces uh, i think this is a question that stares us in the face the third point that i would like to make and some of you may have seen this uh, op-ed piece that came out a couple of days ago which was co-authored by uh, the chair of the igf leadership uh, panel and the uh, technology envoy where they actually argue about how in the future of internet governance there needs to be a protective moat around the technical governance in terms of preserving the a political structure and functioning but looking back at what has like you know transpired and the history that has occurred is actually like internet governance really a political we all know the story of the incomplete internationalization of i can and we know the default is like one state like is able to control the critical internet resources still so if we are not like truly internationalizing internet governance and we are still like continuing to hold on to a, a somewhat like you know fictionalized idea of a political technical governance where at another level we all recognize that all uh, uh, technical choices are political uh, choices as lawrence lessig said uh, code is law and architecture is a policy choice and we see that the different geopolitical or economic visions of development have led us to a situation where in uh, in contrast to the internet we have known there is another vision of the internet that stands before us today imagined by another state with a different political model and we don't want to be caught in a geopolitical war of like you know where different political visions lead to internet fragmentation but if we have to address this question we have to talk about what are these political choices and not like rest in this like same old like idea of a political internet governance we must move beyond that and look at like what would it mean to truly internationalize uh, internet governance the final point and i'll just like take very little time um i think that when we look at the approaches uh, it may be important to not to see the global public goods and commons as oppositional approaches as is traditionally done uh, you know uh, like when you talk about commons and when you talk about uh, public goods uh, at some level there is like you know this interesting research work that is coming out of uh, utrecht university which is talking about the fact that often times a public goods approach will provision the infrastructure on which commoning can take place because it's important to think of like commoning as a noun and also remember the communities the people who are commoning and then we have to make choices where we may under, we may be kind of like having this realistic approach where the, uh, like in, when you think about economy and india my country has traditionally thought of mixed economy you have public enterprise you have private enterprise you have cooperativist enterprise so when we think of internet governance model we must be actually asking ourselves how do we get the public infrastructure and the public financing and generally like the governance of the standards in a way that is truly public so you build a common that is truly belonging to the people and not a pro capitalist commons that is then just cannibalized by uh, big tech so looking forward to hearing from everyone i'll just uh, stop here thank you nandini um well for calling attention about the idea of the commons and the reality check of the critical areas that we need that need fixing so that we can actually have a commons and for already touching on what will be the second part of our discussions here today um and i'll invite now bruna bruna we will also talk about the internet as a commons bruna martin santos is a global campaigns uh, manager at digital action Bruna, you have the floor. 
always forget to turn it on. Thanks a lot, Paula, and, and thanks APC for the invitation as well. Um, and to bring such a relevant debate to the IGF, right? Um, I guess in the past years, all of us had spent at least a week in one of these forums um, or spaces discussing the most relevant issues. But we all live um, these spaces feeling really bad and heavy from the pessimistic approach that um, normally the internet governance discussion has taken. So it's good for once to be doing a more positive debate and one that looks towards to the future. I, I would say, I'll maybe start by saying that for the past um, 30, 20, 30 years, um, internet governance discussions have all guided us through the processes, right? And operated under a normative framework um, that's focused on rules and values. All of that because it acknowledges how relevant the internet is for societies and for its develop development. There is a rich story and experience on how it, the internet works, what are the bodies that are involved in it, but we do lack sometimes the further inclusion of some other parts and some other groups in society. Or even we, um, we do fail in bringing in this very strong global majority narrative to the conversation that's so relevant for everyone involved in this discussion to understand what are the problems in reality. But despite of that, um, we have also been watching the world go more and more complex in the past years, and the equation around things such as elections or human rights gets even more complex with many stakeholders being called to the responsibility um, to protect ecosystems and rights. And to me, this is very much connected to this discussion, right? Um, but at the same time, I think it's also possible for, for us to say that despite a lot of the society issues we face nowadays and sometimes problematic governmental intervention, the internet remains resilient and its core um, characteristics, characteristic and aspects um, are still there. Um, it, they, and it still allows for everyone to exist and express itself and it, it should, and it's still perceived as a basic and common and really core aspect of um, every place that we're at. Um, I would like to also add that it's interesting to see how the community is, is evolving towards reflections and debates about things such as um, the failure of some companies and corporations. But um, in the end of the day, this is really a conversation such a, about what are the discrepancies? Um, what is lacking in access when we talk about access? What is lacking when we talk about empowering stakeholders and bringing more voices? Um, as the good and old saying says, access to Facebook is not access to the internet, and we should not really rest until everybody understands and, and adds um, layers to that. Um, just to maybe um, start going towards the, the, the topic more further, um, as a global public resource, I would say the internet has to be universal and affordable, and its governance should be grounded in international and human rights standards and public interest principles. Um, technologies in the internet itself, they do play a crucial role in addressing a lot of the global challenges, and we do need um, global calls to action to advance access to them and encourage countries to build what is needed in terms of um, technologies for everybody. And this says a lot about enhancing safeguards, um, addressing governance, governance issues, and mitigating some of the abuse and some of the problems um, in this space, as Luca was also referring to. Um, last but not least, I would say that more proactive engagement of the technical community is also required in this debate. Um, the internet doesn't magically exist or simply operate. Um, we do rely on a lot of folks and expertise um, for it to exist. So the, the success of all of that and the success of spaces such as the IGF is also reliant on these types of communities such as the technical one. Um, and the last thing that I would say is um, that when we talk about all of this, the global equity crisis needs to be a key aspect of such discussions. A lot of the internet-related problems are rooted in inequality. This is one of them. Abuse of power is another of the issues, and insufficient co collaboration is another one of the topics. And um, the fact that the narratives from the parts of the world that suffer most with sad interventions are not the ones shaping the policies is problematic, so we need the global majority to be making the calls and, le and leading the processes. And I do hope that in um, the future of spaces such as the GDC and Summit of the Future, we take that into consideration. So I guess I'll stop here, and thanks a lot, Paula. Thanks to you, Bruna. Thanks for talking about 
the importance of actually not only reflecting about different approaches, but also different realities, the role of inequalities and power politics behind uh, the policy choices. And with that, I'll move on to our um, final speaker of this round that will be again joining us online. And I'll invite Azim Tajini. Azim is human rights officer from the rule of law and democracy section of the Office of the High Commi the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Azim, can you hear us? You have the floor. Very well. Thank you so much. And I, I hope you can hear me as well. Um, yes. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be with you and, and to also listen to um, people whose work I admire so much. So um, I'll say a few uh, words about internet as a, or internet access as a, as a human rights or as an enabler of human rights. And, and this is a question that also um, Mr. Castro uh, alluded to in the beginning about how to actually legal, uh, legally conceptualize um, the internet and internet access. Uh, which is a big debate. It's also a big debate also in the human rights world. Um, is it a human right in itself? Is it not? And what difference um, would it make? So there is these two poles um, um, uh, that we have. Uh, on the one side, the view that um, internet is a technology um, and it's a means to an end, um, but not an end in itself. And so it is not a human rights and it shouldn't be a human right. Um, and this, uh, the view that, well, it's an enabler um, of human rights is, is what is currently reflected in the state of international human rights law, where uh, internet access um, yet is not uh, recognized as a, as a right in itself. Um, but uh, it is recognized as an enabler right in the sense that restrictions to internet access can constitute uh, undue interference with rights such as freedom of expression or freedom of peaceful assembly, but also of socioeconomic rights such as the right to education, the right to health. So in other words, from this point of view, there is um, this conceptualization means that there is a negative duty on states not to unduly interfere with rights as exercised online, but there is not a positive duty to actually provide internet access. And on the other hand, there is the, the view that internet access is not only a tool, but it's become so intertwined with our basic ability um, to exercise our rights um, that it should be considered a human rights. And then, in other words, there is a positive duty on, on states to ensure, act, uh, to ensure access. Um, and I'll go a bit back to this, but um, even though I initially mentioned that internationally there's no such, uh, or we, we haven't reached a, a state where international human rights law actually creates a legal obligation to ensure uh, internet access. Um, <clears throat> at the domestic level, in some states, uh, this is already considered a right. Um, so it's an individual or a constitutional right in the sense that the law establishes, establishes a positive duty on, on the state to ensure universal access, and in some cases also affordable access. So some examples that I think we, we uh, have all heard of is, for example, the Constitution of Greece um, that um, uh, states that the facilitation of access to electronically transmitted information um, and the production exchange and diffusion of such information constitutes an obligation of the states. And there's also a similar, a similar language uh, from the Constitutional Court of France and the Constitutional Court of uh, Costa Rica um, and um, a bit similar to what um, also I think the bill that is proposed in Chile, there is um, a law in, in Finland that has declared broadband access a basic right. Uh, and similarly in Estonia, internet access is part of the universal service um, that the state has to provide to, to all its people. So at the, at the domestic level, there has been a development towards recognizing internet access as a right and as a positive obligation of the state. Um, and at the international level, that's not the case. Although here, I think it's also important to bear in mind where we've come from. So the development um, of, uh, of, of how, how international human rights law deals with the internet. And um, one milestone is of course the, the 2012 uh, Human Rights Council resolution um, that was uh, adopted to protect free speech on the internet. 
um, and that called upon states to promote and facilitate access to the internet and international cooperation aimed at developing media and information communication facilities in all countries. So it was the first UN resolution of its kind. And since then, um, there's a growing attention by human rights mechanisms, uh, treaty bodies, special procedures, um, as well as regional human rights mechanisms about the, the importance of the internet and internet access um, to the ability of people to enjoy and exercise their rights. And this is also recognized by the Sustainable Development Goals uh, which um, reinforces um, an obligation to work towards um, universal and accessible internet. Um, so there is, um, there is this uh, development, and I think from an international human rights perspective, what would be important to ask if, is, so if, if we recognize human right as a, as a uh, if, if we recognize universal uh, internet access as a right, what what should that mean? Because there's no one form of right. You have, uh, you have rights that can be um, can be realized progressively depending on the resources of the state. Um, and and so, what would what would a human right to internet access actually look like? Um, would it be an absolute right? Uh, probably not. But if not, what would be the conditions for um, for restrictions? Um, would it um, what would it mean for the interplay between state and private sector, uh, given precisely the, the, the sort of global nature of the internet? Um, and what would it mean, for example, for a state duty to protect people from cyber attack that uh, inhibit their access to the internet? So even if we move towards, um, or if international human rights law moves towards increasingly recognizing universal access as a, as a human right, the question still remains, well, what kind of right do we want it to be and what would it actually, what kind of obligations should it actually create? Um, I'll stop there and I'll look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much for well telling us a little bit of the state of the art, where we are exactly in the discussions. We still have two views on the internet as a right in itself and the internet as an enabler. Um, but um, I understand that not only in the examples of national legislation, but the other examples uh, of global policy that you mentioned, this um, direction you know, that it seems that we are taking to, to recognize it, access um, to the internet as a right in itself. And with that, we'll move on to the second part of our discussion here today, that is inviting some commentators to react to these different approaches that were shared with us. Um, and the question is, like, what are the key, the main takeaways um, from what you've heard? What are the main commonalities, the div divergences, um, and, and how these different um, concepts can be combined, complemented, how they relate to each other, and how we could use them um, in global policy spaces? Easy questions. So, Anhyet, I'll start with you. Uh, Anhyet Esther Hoysen is Senior Advisor for Global and Regional Internet Governance with the Association for Pro Progressive Communications. Anhyet. Thanks. I was just trying to convince David to go first. Um, thanks very much. And I'm sorry I was late. I, I had another session that ran a little bit late. I, I, I don't know if I have anything useful to say, even though this is a concept that I've personally been grappling with for a long time. And I think what I really want to celebrate and thank APC for doing is to actually get us to talk about this at the IGF, because I think what this is responding to is a conversation that internet governance should have started with, not actually be trying to end with um, or, or, or go into its next, next evolution cycle with. Um, I think that, I mean, anyone from the technical community who if they were here, would say to you, the internet is not one thing. But actually, as I listened to the speakers, it, it, I, it resonated with me. The internet is not one thing. Um, and for me, that also resonated with Nandini's comment about not looking at commons and public good as being in, in opposition. And I think similarly, looking at internet or access to the internet as a human right or as an enabler 
of other human rights. That's also not a, a conflictual. So I think that there, there's real um, synergy between these three different concepts that are being discussed. And I think what they all speak to is the fundamental problem. And I think Nandini articulated that well, and maybe maybe also before I came, but the fact that the how we imagined this internet as a connector of people, as a disruptor of concentration of power, as a leveler of, 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 of distributing more voice and, and more influence. Um, we've lost that to a large extent. And I think what we are really talking about here, whether we are entering it from the commons perspective, the rights perspective, or the public good perspective, is to look at a, at a framework that will allow us to reclaim that. Um, and, 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 and then I want to just go back to, to reflect on maybe this is about the internet, internet not being one thing. And I think we also have to keep in mind that, that it evolves. Um, and that if we are going to try and make a contribution to internet governance and, and encourage some kind of paradigm shift, if we can get as far as that, I think it has to be something that is future-oriented, that, that can address the challenges of how a technology that emerges within the public domain, for example, can then become appropriated by commercial interests, further developed and, and invest. It's a little bit like the pharmaceutical industry. We wouldn't have medication um, if it wasn't for private sector money going into it, but we also wouldn't have drugs and retrovirals in my country if governments did not intervene um, to ensure that those patents were available. So you need a shift of some kind. Um, so I'm not going to. I'm going to let David give you all the answers. But what I want to say is that I think we can look at the concept of the public core of the internet. That is a norm that has been developed. I, I was personally involved in that. The Dutch government, Dennis Bruder, uh, did some work on this. A Dutch academic, but trying to identify if there are parts of this distributed, interconnected internet which we can actually govern and 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 regulate and manage as. Uh, um, a public good, a public infrastructure. There are analogies. We can look at, at, at places where water is supplied in a municipality by private companies, but there are standards and procedures that private companies have to adhere to to ensure that that water is affordable, that it's available, that it's clean. So, And, and then we have the notion of the protection of the public core as well, which it requires both governments and companies not to interfere with it in particular ways. Then I think there's the idea of the commons, and I like Nandini telling us that we don't have to think of them as alternatives, public good, which generally comes with more of a sense of the public sector and the state having to play a stewardship role, and the commons, which is much more of a bottom-up process. There are parts of the internet, which I think is the commons, um, um, but then they are also part of the internet that is run by the private sector and that's built out by the private sector and we have to accommodate that we can't change that I don't believe in nationalizing the internet but I also don't believe in surveillance capitalism and models where 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 we 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 are ex our data our behavior our communications are being extracted uh, for commercial gain. And I think there are ways of looking at that, very practical ways, for example, such as the data that, that, uh, that emerges from all these companies. The European Union now has regulation that ensures researchers have access to that data. If you're in Brazil and you want to access what happened during the election with social media last year, was it last year or the year before? Last year you'd have to pay millions of dollars to get access to that data. So there, there, there are lots of things, there are parts of the internet that I think that we should be able to claim um, as being in the public domain. And then I think, then I'm just going to end with two bullet points before I give this to, to David. I think it is important to recognize that the architecture of both the internet and of internet governance, the, so the, the, the technical architecture and the governance, including the technical governance, is not apolitical. I think that's a very important starting point. And I think Bruna also made that point, that point about power. Um, and uh, I think that's important. And then my final bullet point is, uh, Mr. Castro, I didn't hear your comments, but I think Lucas' point about both the positive and the negative 
outcomes of looking at the internet as a public good. I think all governance models, including the status quo uh, governance models, we need to look at both the intended and the unintended uh, um, positive and negative uh, consequences. And I don't think we're doing enough of that with the status quo. Um, but as we develop alternative models, we also need to look at intended and unintended consequences. Thank you, Henriette. David, we are ready for all the answers now. Um, so um, I'll invite you <laughs> to share with us. I was trained you don't get answers Let me just introduce you, wait to this. Let me just introduce, because I failed to do so. So David Soter is Managing Director of ICT Development Associates. David, now you go. <laughs> Sorry. Um, sometimes I have the misfortune to examine PhD theses in the social sciences, and to some extent, I felt like this is like the first, the opening chapters of those theses where the, the poor student has to go through every kind of theory that there has been in the area in which they're trying to uh, work on and then bring those things together and come up with something, some kind of new concept, a new contribution, uh, which draws on each of those other areas of previous work. Um, and in very many cases, they get trapped in the semantics of this. Uh, and I, I think there is a danger here of being trapped in the semantics of this. It, it, there are, OK, so there are different conceptualizations here. And you can draw on all of them. Um, necessary to say A is better than B is better than C, or A plus B plus C is essential. Um, there, there, there are, you can draw on these things without putting them together. And that's to say, I was trained as an historian, not as a social scientist. And historians start from uh, by looking at the evidence and only come to the conceptualizations uh, that social sciences, scientists use at the end of their analysis of the, uh, of the process. So that's how I tend to look at things. Um, I, so um, let, I'm saying don't be trapped in the semantics. Um, I think there are, these are fairly random thoughts about the three, uh, the three points that were made. So they're not, uh, they're, there's, there is no constructed theory here because you can't write an essay while sitting listening to the presentations. Um, just in terms of, firstly in terms of public goods, I mean, I, when this was first talked about on the internet, public, uh, public goods about 20 years ago, um, there was a lot of confusion uh, because there is the economic definition of public goods as non-excludable and non-rival, which was understood by economists. But then non-economists were using the term to um, refer to things that were for the good of the public, um, and in particular to see the internet as a, a delivery mechanism for things that were for the good of the public. And that very much puts it in uh, the kind of um, area of... Uh, traditional regulation of utilities. It's saying it's a, it's, it's a utility which provides a service to people and therefore should be universally accessible and available at affordable prices so that everyone can, can benefit from it. It seems to me that that's the, the kind of genesis of that concept of, uh, of, of public good. Um, whereas the concept from the commons seems to me to be derived more from the internet as a communications medium. Um, and um, uh, in that context, um, so, so it's a communications medium and it should be universally available because it is a communications medium and enables everybody to talk to everybody else as opposed to a medium that delivers to them my, uh, you know, products and services. Um, and I think the issue here is to do, to some extent, with the evolution of the, um, of the internet. So the, you know, what, once upon a time, it was small and now it is large. And in things that are as large as the internet, you have infrastructure and you have intermediaries. It's not possible for something that large to be conducted without those things. And if you have infrastructure and intermediaries, you have the power structures that go with that. You have a requirement of a capital investment, uh, and there are not many places where that capital investment can come from. Uh, and in the case of the internet, you also, and other communications media, you also have network externalities. So um, the more people there are on Facebook, the more valuable it is by a factor that is more than equivalent to the numbers. Uh, if you have 10 million people on something, it is much more valuable to you, one person, than if there are only 10,000 on it. Um, and those things drive uh, the power of data corporations. 
it's very difficult to see how you can avoid those power structures. So if you can't avoid those power structures, well, it's not possible to see how you can avoid them if you have to regulate them. Um, so re it brings, I think, back to the regulatory structures that are required. And there are traditional economic models for doing that as well. Um, the rights perspective is um, obviously crucially important, but it the rights framework, the international rights framework, doesn't cover everything that needs to be considered here. Uh, and that's, I think, part of the uh, difficulty in trying to root things in a purely rights perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so the rights perspective focuses, uh, the, the rights framework focuses on states, not on corporations. And increasingly it's corporations where the real power lies. So where are the responsibilities and obligations that are placed on those corporations? Um, Generally, there's been um, a discussion in, in a rights context about particular rights, and there's been an underemphasis on economic, social, and cultural rights, uh, and so on the the, uh, the development and environment kind of uh, domains. Um, and I think the rights perspective is a different lens to that which is used by the most powerful actors within um, the internet world. So it, it's a different lens to that used by governments. It's a different lens to that used by corporations. Um, it's a different lens in particular to that used by some governments and some corporations. Um, so it's an extremely important perspective, but it's not sufficient in itself to cover all that is required. Uh, those are random thoughts, not yet in essay form. Thank you, David. And um, I think our proposal is not to get lost in translation. It's not merely a theoretical exercise, what we are proposing for the discussion here today, but really to think about the policy consequences and use these entry points to discuss um, the nature of the internet and what kind of policy responses we're looking for um, for the upcoming years and for right now, actually, for the present, not only for the future. Um, what we'll have now is um, we'll open the floor for questions. Um, so, Nandini, in a second, I'll give you the floor to share if there are any questions online. Then I'll ask here um, if there are any questions in the room. And after that, I'll give you all, speakers from the first round, a final chance to react <laughs> again to the comments that you heard from the commentators. You have two minutes each, so it's just uh, like firing back, uh, maybe if there are any specific questions to you. And then we will wrap up with my colleague Valeria that will try to systematize the key points coming out of the discussion. So, Nandini, do we have any question from the online participants? Uh, yeah. There are about like uh, four questions. So how many can we take, uh, Paula? Let me see how many questions we have in the room. One. If you are going to read them quickly, are they are all questions or comments? They're all questions. Mm, OK. So yeah, just uh, read them all. <laughs> we will give the floor <laughs> here in the room. And um, I'll just invite you to do your best to respond to them. Go ahead, mm -hmm. Nandini. Yeah. Uh, so the first question is uh, about like, you know, uh, how do we uh, ensure that what are the best approaches to ensure that we bring affordable connectivity to the largest number of people? Uh, the second uh, question uh, is actually, uh, yeah, this, the second one is a comment about the uh, internet uh, as a tool for empowerment. So I skip that. And the third is a question about how, what do we do about the energy footprint and the consequences of the greenhouse gas emissions and everything of like digital technologies? And how do you think of the sustainability question in the uh, era of uh, 4AR? And uh, the last question is uh, about uh, when is it possible to make internet available and accessible for the underprivileged in developing countries? And what should actually be done about it? Like what can we do next? Thank you, Nandini. Dinesh, if you could use the microphone to your left. Um, thanks, Nandini. I think your, uh, what you said actually uh, kind of addresses, like mentions what I want to ask, but uh, I want to be very specific in what I want to say, which is internet for all of us is the web. 
and not accessibility in terms of infrastructure, the fiber, the something and all that. Internet is the web, which is hyperlinks, interlinking, hypertext, and all those things. Now, there are three billion people in the world who cannot read and write. One billion in India who cannot like do Google search, make sense of the results, and if you can't read and write, what is internet for you? Why are we not pushing technical people to look at this and see what is hyperlinking when you don't have text? What is, you know? And there's so much we can do. And we as a group of very highly evolved literate people stop asking questions when it comes to the web and the internet. For example, when you give a book, you write on the margins, how many of you have asked, why don't I have it on the web? You know, this is a starting of a beginning, beginning at like why we need to push things. Okay, this is all I want to say. And we need to look at it. IGF is a forum, not like the Silicon Valley, not like the corporate, not like something where we can actually take a decision and what is the technology that helps push the web to the low literate people. Thank you, Dinesh. Mr. Castro, can we start with you? Two minutes. Everybody will have two minutes to react, or both to respond to questions and, um, and also some reactions. Would you like to, yeah? Okay, so Luca, we'll start with you. All right, so I just, I want to react quickly to the comment that has just been done about the fact that for most people, the internet is the web. <clears throat> I think I disagree. And my point before was precisely that for most people, actually the internet is not the web. Because for those who have the privilege to have fixed internet access and you can use the web as an app to browse through the internet and that is a chance. But for most people, actually, a couple of billions at least of people in the world, a web is only a, a small part of what they do in the internet. What they primarily do in the internet is using two or three applications, uh, which is a, a, on their mobile phone. So it's, it's, it's a very tiny part of the internet and it's really an enormous walled garden in which they do not uh, they can they don't have the privilege of being internet users browsing through the web but they are uh, datafied basically the entire the entire day and they are fed with algorithmically recommended uh, content based either on their profile or based on who pays the most so the uh, i think that if we want to start then to get into what the IGF could do. Well, it, what has been doing over the past years is allowing a platform for these issues to be discussed. What the IGF has not been doing but should have been done is also to try to recommend solutions that could, should be, that could be utilized to, uh, if not solve, at least mitigate these kind of issues. And these kind of issues, it, they require cooperation. If you take uh, the, my point on the possibility to consider internet as, as a public good, any kind of in public good requires cooperation then to be uh, uh, managed, right? Uh, the um, commentator explained about the fact that then at the end of the day, public goods end up being utilities, of course, because the market does not how to price them, and then you have the uh, usually the state intervening to provide them. But it is also actually a huge problem when you undermine them, because if you use, if you ha lock, for instance, three billion people into a couple of social media platforms and you feed them only with fake news, then you are undermining uh, democracy, you're undermining human rights, you're undermining the economy, but you cannot price it. You cannot say, you can say 10% more connectivity penetration equals to 3.6% increase in, in, in GDP, but you cannot say 70% of people in a country only having access to Facebook equals to minus 50% of democracy, because you cannot price democracy. You cannot price, you cannot meter it. So that the, 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 we, I think that we have to be a little bit creative, all, not only discussing these issues, but also understanding. My point on public goods is not necessarily, I'm not advocating for considering the internet a public good. I think one has con to consider both sides of the coin. And then the interesting part of it would be the, then not to understand whether the internet should be considered a public good, but whether when it undermines public good, goods, how to meter it and which kind of solution, uh, who, who, who should pay this cost? 
Thank you, Luca. Um, yes. Um, Nandini, thank you so much for doubling as our speaker and our online moderator. Um, I would like to give you the floor now to have your final remarks. Uh, yeah, uh, so I would just like to take on one of the questions that came from the Bangladesh Remote Hub, uh, that what is it that it means to make the internet uh, accessible uh, and available and affordable for the most uh, marginalized? Because I think it speaks to everything we have been talking about uh, so far, including the internet as a right, the public good questions and the provisioning, internet as a communication commons that is not like cannibalized by surveillance capital. It speaks to all dimensions of the question. Uh, here, I think that uh, right from the time of the World Summit on the Information Society, we have been like, you know, we failed to find a proper public financing model that can ensure that the internet in its foundational sense and not like a zero services type of walled garden version is available to everyone in the world. And 20 years after the visa or mood, we are still talking about that agenda. So I think we need to uh, kind of like have a way to discuss the financing question about that. And secondly, I think when we are talking about internet access, the question of access to what, which many of us have been talking about today, that needs to also be uh, addressed because what is it that this access is supposed to do? Like there's a study by Research ICT Africa, which actually talks about the connectivity paradox where connectivity actually means like more digital inequality. Is that what we want? Or do we, are we talking about a world where connectivity means uh, equal access to the data dividends and the development dividends of the internet for everyone. So we might have to kind of like push this like in however we engage with in the global digital compact process and the world summit on the information society action lines that may come up. So I feel we have all a lot of work to do here. And thank you again uh, for organizing this very, very important and critical discussion. Thank you, Nandini. Bruna. Thanks, Paula. Um, yeah, just to add some more thoughts to this, I think um, I agree with some of both our commentators' um, additions to the conversation about, from Henriette, that this is a, a debate where internet governance might have started, right? Um, but it's also important to be coming back to this at this point in history where we still see um, the gaps, right? And also agree that some of the, comp the concepts are not that definitely not opposing. Um, as well as with the idea of not getting lost in the semantics um, of the whole conversation. At the same time, addressing the gaps is urgent, mitigating the abuses and discrepancies as well. Um, we are at a moment in history where it seems to be a need to cooperate even further in order to advance the development and use of digital public goods or internet as a common or as a human right. At the same time, it's important to discuss appropriate safeguards to ensure the protection of rights, um, privacy data protection, as well as inclusion of all communities and genders and regions and claims. Um, this will help um, us build trust around this space, foster an inclusive technology ecosystem that also meets um, the needs of the local populations that, because that's what we're talking about. And last but not least, I would say, we do need, and I hope we get out of the GDC, more recognition of the internet mm -hmm and information as a commons or a public good, um, and, and how are we moving forward in governing that and managing that as a collective resource. So, thanks a lot. Thank you, Bruna. Azim, can we hear from you? Thank you, um, uh, and, and thanks to everyone, uh, including the questions online. So, yeah, just to start, I think I, um, I, I completely agree with David's point that the, the rights framework um, doesn't and, and cannot um, cover all the elements of internet, internet governance, um, all, all the questions that arise there. But I, I think it's, it's still um, the, the development of, of, of the development in the rights um, uh, landscape will also impact very much on the reality. So, so rights will not just reflect the the, the facts, uh, very often they don't, <laughs> uh, but the way in which the, the, these discussions are uh, later articulated in terms of uh, rights, um, uh, legally conceptualized rights, will also impact how, how of course, uh, internet governance takes place. And, and so it's, it's a very central part of the discussion. 
Um, and also just on the inf on the on the sort of um, question about um, infrastructure versus access, um, I think. One added value of the rights framework is particularly the question about what type of internet um, or what, what type of access do we actually speak about? Um, and um, uh, what kind of content do we speak about considering that so much of the content um, in places where people actually do have access to the internet is very heavily interfered with by states, but also by, by private sector. Um, so that's where um, I think there's an added value of the of, of the rights framework, which provides for uh, the free flow of ideas uh, of all kinds. Thank you, Azim. I only refer to to the speakers, but I will. We still have some time, so I'll give um, our commentators also the chance to share some final remarks before we have a quick systematization of the key takeaways. Um, David, Henriet, who wants to start? No, I'm asking if you want to. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll just pick up on a couple of the questions um, and kind of raise some complications with them. Um, so, firstly, on on empowerment uh, and tools for empowerment. Um, I've always had a, a slight problem with the way in which this concept is used because um, uh, innovations like the internet empower everyone, um, not just those who are disempowered um, and not just those who uh, we might hope to empower because they, uh, you know, because they are disempowered or for progressive reasons. Um, and the internet empowers everybody, including people who are powerful and abuse their power. Uh, so, and, and in particular, it can, um, it can empower people in the sense that people who are dis disadvantaged in the sense that it gives them additional resources which they can use in effective ways, but at the same time, it can empower those who have power over them more than it empowers them. So think of that in terms of employer-employee relationships, say, or landlord-tenant relationships, or some gender relationships, uh, family relationships. Um, so empowerment is a more complicated issue, I think, than, than is often discussed here. Uh, on the environmental point, I, I didn't quite catch the question, I'm afraid, but I, um, uh, I sort of um, I, I spoke in the main session um, uh, from the platform this morning in the, the main session on the environment. Um, and so I do think this is a particularly um, uh, important dimension and is often missing from still missing from our discussions about the direction of um, internet development and more generally digital development, which is now much larger than internet development. Um, and I think we, the, um, there are many dimensions to it. It's often discussed in digital fora on the basis of what can be done with digital technology to address particularly climate change. Um, but it's important to look at this in a, in a broader perspective. So there were three ways in which um, the digital sector is currently, is currently unsustainable uh, in the way that it is progressing. And those are to do with the uh, over-exploitation of scarce resources which are used in digital devices. Um, the energy consumption gross rate uh, and, uh, and e-waste, which is rarely recycled and substantially dumped in developing countries. Um, so all of those things need to be addressed. And what I was proposing in the session this morning was um, that we need to introduce into, uh, across the board in internet governance and in the thinking of governments and businesses and uh, tech, uh, the technical sector, an environmental ethos which thinks about environmental impacts as part of decision-making processes, for example, in setting standards, in developing new applications, in deploying networks. So that, uh, so that the, the goal is both to maximize the potential value uh, of those innovations and to minimize their environmental footprint. Thanks very much. Um, well, 
I mean, thanks for, for the questions. And I, I mean, I think much as we want a paradigm shift, we're not going to get one. So we have to start somewhere. And I think the, the, the one thing that we, there is a lot of regulation of the internet. I mean, the, we've talked about the European Digital Services, Digital Market Act. There's regulation at many, many country levels as well. But I think the problem is that the regulation, a lot of the regulation is actually not targeting the powerful, it's targeting people, it's tar targeting users. It's not par targeting the manufacturers of the devices. Um, or the builders of the infrastructure. So I think maybe a shift away, yes, regulatory response is necessary, but shift that regulatory response in such a way that it actually tries to address concentration of power uh, in a more effective way. And this applies also to the issue of the environment and environmental impact. So we need more common acknowledgement and some principles that we need to regulate how companies do business on the internet, not just in the European Union and not just targeting the big tech companies. Actually, we need to look at, at business as a whole and look at diversifying and open, opening markets more and opening innovation more. You know, we talk, this notion of permissionless innovation is another thing. We need to be able to regulate innovation in such a way not to prevent it, but to prevent harm. And we have principles from the, the, the pharmaceutical industry, the idea of the precautionary principle. If new apps are developed that could change how children learn or how people interact with one another, and why should those not be first tested uh, before they can go into operation? I think we need to also regulate how, how infrastructure is built from an environmental impact and energy uh, perspective. Um, and yes, I've mentioned devices already, and this includes the disposal of the devices, but the endurance of the devices. I mean, surely we should have regulations that, that stop e-waste from proliferating um, in, at the rate that it does. One can introduce standards for the manufacturing of devices so that they last longer, so that they can be updated. It is possible to change that. But I think to change that, we also need to shift our understanding of development, this whole notion that growth equals development, that, 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 you know, that will alleviate poverty by creating more rich people. You know, we need to shift away from those conceptions. But then I think one of the real challenges here is that um, because we're dealing with a globalized network and a globalized market, um, we, we cannot rely on our traditional, I think the rights, fr uh, as in, by the way, I think the rights framework does give us what we want, but there's one thing in the rights framework that doesn't work that well for us, and that's the concept of the state as duty bearers and the rest of us as rights holders, and that it's the state's responsibility to ensure that private sector actors comply with rights frameworks. It's very hard to make that work within the current internet context, both because the company are so powerful and because the states are so unaccountable. Um, it becomes very hard to trust states to play the role of holding business accountable when states themselves are not accountable for acting in the public interest and managing and growing the internet and uh, regulating the internet in the public interest. And then I think we also need to have a, first, a third dimension here and that is about empowering communities and allowing communities to create their own approach to internet. I mean, what one of the things that we've learned in APC by working with community networks is that there are communities who only want internet in their village. They don't actually want to connect to the global internet. They're quite happy just to be able to have free WhatsApp calls, you know, in, in, their, in their own area. So I think that's the third thing. So I, I want to stop at that, but I do want to say, I think, I think with, you know, as in mentioned, the complexity of the human rights framework, I think it gives us a lot to work with. I disagree with you in that, David. And I think we, she didn't mention specifically, but the, the business, the guidelines on business and human rights, which will probably never become a treaty, because some governments will block it, but it's providing us with really good guidelines on how to ensure that companies are accountable. Thank you all for the very insightful contributions. Very, very interesting. And I'll give now the floor to my colleague, Valeria, that took lots of notes, and she's going to tell, tell us how we are going to use all these insights that we, <laughs> we just compiled here today. Valeria. 
Thank you so much, Paula, and thank you so much uh, to all of you for your in insights. Uh, actually, Andrea did my everything. Uh, you did my job, so thank you so much, Andrea. Because yes, <laughs> so uh, I, I won't repeat what uh, has been said. I just want to say that um, we were motivated to convene this conversation because obviously there are questions that are not resolved, starting by the basic one about what the internet is and also how we can deal moving forward with the governance of uh, not only the internet itself, but the governance of the implications and impacts of its use. And uh, we are in a very particular moment in which also the evolution of internet governance is proving uh, that it is interplaying very directly and deeply with the broader governance of the digital realm. So in that, in this current moment in which uh, several spaces and processes dealing with, with issues of, uh, of, of, uh, the, of uh, the internet policy and internet governance and digital governance have proliferated. So what we can do, what's next? Uh, what is, uh, how we can keep contributing to it? Like two years ago, we started a process to imagine the future of internet governance. Uh, and this session kind of closes that initial phase of um, our reflection and also the, 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 the thinking and analysis of how we can uh, feed into these several processes that are looking at the, at, at the configuration of the digital future. So in this moment, uh, uh, I think, well, the, the speakers have said it all. I think uh, what we can uh, push for and how we expect to use the outcomes of this conversation is to pre precisely nurture and feed into the thinking of what are the compromises that are needed between the different stakeholders and what's the principles that should guide uh, internet governance and digital governance moving forward to precisely set to precisely avoid avoid what Andrea was saying to avoid like causing further harm and uh, putting people in the center and, and regulating in a way that we address the structural problems and particularly the concentration of power in in, in corporations but also the lack of accountability of uh, public actors in particularly government so we expect to use those not only in the framework of the IGF and the conversations happen in here, but also in the framework of the Global Digital Compact and uh, the WSIS Plus 20 review and the commitments emerging uh, uh, in the context of the acceleration of the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. So the, the role that we want to play and how we want to use these inputs is to make sure that these questions that uh, have kept unresolved for so long are still addressed and that we address in a way that help us to move towards basic compromises to address a structural inequality uh, towards uh, uh, you know, uh, ensuring that uh, the internet can serve the purposes of ensuring a dignified life for everyone. So that's what I want to say and then I pass it to you, Paula, for closing. And I would just like to thank you all again. Thank you, you, Valeria, the participants online, the speakers online. And with that, uh, we wrap up the session of today. Bye.